you I know, some of you I do not, but I welcome you to the conversation. And I'm really looking forward to discussing uh, the challenges facing Native American veterans when they transition back to their communities, as well as some of the solutions that we've devised are in Hesperus to really serve this population. So in honor of Native American Her Heritage Month and how we support veterans during the month of November, I'm excited to invite you all to talk with us today. Um, to my knowledge, there's never been a discussion like this online around Native American veterans and their service, their challenges, but more importantly, solutions. As you know, all of our communities in the veteran space, and there are, it reflects the reality of American life. We have people from all walks of life that serve our country. And then ultimately, whether it's after four or five years or 20 or 30, they've got to go home. Today, we want to talk about what that looks like in this community and why it's important that we think about not just our active duty service members, but more importantly, why we're focused on veterans and have them having a successful transition in these tribal communities. Uh, I'm Matt Brogdon. I'm a U.S. Army veteran. I've been in recruiting for about 21 years. I've been focused on helping place vets into corporate America and in positions all over the country for almost my entire time out of the service. Um, I focus on job placement, diversity, inclusion, but I've also had a great experience in technology, specifically in biotech and the tech industries, um, both, uh, you know, in the application of technology, but also in the training and placement in technology, which is going to be important when we get to the end of this. So I come to this uh, as a founder and as a director, executive director of Hesperus, with a knowledge of the program, but also with the idea that I don't know everything, which is why I'm bringing this panel to you today, right? Let's all get educated. So today, without um, uh, much more talk and discussion, I want to introduce our panel and then I wanna get right to it. So first I'd like to introduce Christopher Key. Christopher, you wouldn't mind introducing yourself. Chris, you're on mute. Thanks. <laughs> I, I was just saying, I, I deeply appreciate the, um, the opportunity to be part of this panel and, um, and more importantly, being a part of this effort. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Christopher Key. I'm an advocate for Native Americans <clears throat> communities, excuse me, and I'm also the owner operator of uh, True North, which is a consultant company. Um, uh, throughout the past five years, I've been consulting and working with tribal communities to develop and enhance their economic development efforts, um, along with their health and welfare um, efforts. I can all and um, uh, economic development and education, as well as um, um, human, I mean, natural resources, excuse, excuse me. Um, so I've been doing this for about five years prior to that. I, I've had the opportunity to work with several companies, AT&T, JPL, NASA, Qualcomm. Um, I have a background in business and as well as in, as well as a, and in engineering. So um, throughout my tenure in the professional, mainstream, I have uh, had that fortunate opportunity to work and develop um, programs within these companies to enhance the recruitment of Native Americans. But um, about six years ago, I felt that I, I wasn't making a, a big enough impact. So I kind of stepped out of the box and I decided to go out on my own and um, hang my hat on doing things at an organic level, uh, working with the, the tribal communities. And throughout the, the, the process, I've kind of understood and it was it's quite obvious to me that um, there was a certain space within these communities that were being overlooked and underserved and that was the veteran community. So I'm, um, you know, working and trying to figure out how we best provide opportunities and services to this group. You know, um, you know we kind of work together to optimize uh, to some sort of a, a formula so that we can move forward. So. I've, given that, I've also had the opportunity to um, engage with other companies, such as um, um, the local companies, Intel, um, and working with ACES, SACNIS, and um, the affiliated tribes of the Northwest and South on um, the Southern California Chairman's, um, Chairman's Association. So um, 
moving forward, I think I'd wanted to really emphasize three areas which um, contribute toward the success and achievement of what we're trying to do here, which is education, technology, and employment as it relates to um, at a grassroots level on the reservation side of things. Awesome, thank you. And before I introduce Teresa, Chris, what's your tribal affiliation? I'm sorry, I, I'm an enrolled member of the San Carlos Apache tribe. All right, thank you. Welcome, and uh, I want to introduce uh, Teresa. I've known Chris for six years. Uh, I met Teresa in Los Angeles last year at a hackathon, and uh, then we cheered on the USC football team together. So I appreciate her being here today. Teresa? Hi, Matt. Thank you for having me. I feel very honored to be here as a guest. Um, my name is Teresa Wood. I am affiliated um, and enrolled in the Navajo Nation tribe. Um, also known as the Ne, um, and I'm also a Marine veteran. I served uh, from 2002 to 2006 as an administrator, pencil pusher. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's that's my background. Um, I I have a degree in business administration. I've always um, dreamt of you know owning my own business or. Um, you know, finding some way to contribute to the Navajo Nation because there are a myriad of issues going on since I could last remember. Um, and uh, I worked, I have a background in finance. I currently work for a fintech company, Quick Fee, as an administrator. Very grateful for the time to participate in this panel as they let me um, go ahead and do that. So I'm very grateful. I did meet Matt at a hackathon and um, uh, our team won. And uh, just, it's been a great, um, great run ever since. And that really gave me some encouragement to continue with my professional endeavors. Um, so um, yeah, great, great, to, happy to be here. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. And to clear things up, I was not on any team in that hackathon. I was just helping put it together. I'm not technical at all. Um, so the last person I'd like to introduce, and certainly not least, uh, is Kim Mitchell. Kim Mitchell and I were in a fellowship program last year. Um, she is a dedicated supporter of veterans and a veteran herself, but I'd like for her to introduce herself too from, from National. Well, hello everyone and thanks Matt for hosting uh, this wonderful discussion that I think is uh, very much needed uh, in, the, in the veteran community today. Uh, a little bit about me as I'm a, a Navy veteran. I was 17 years in the Navy. Um, uh, when I left the Navy in 2012, I very, I basically entered the, the nonprofit world and I've been in the nonprofit world since, so then, since then, uh, really looking at resources and community, uh, community engagement of what it really takes for successful reintegration for our veterans, our military families and our gold star families. Um, I'm a, the, currently the senior vice president here at National University for Military Veteran and Government Affairs. And we are the education partner in this endeavor because of, of uh, who National is and how we got started by a veteran and, and why I think uh, since I'm leading the effort that I, I think this is a very much needed uh, endeavor that I think that we can make a positive impact on many of our veterans uh, here in the United States. So thank you, Matt, for inviting me to participate. Thanks, Kim. Uh, so without uh, much more, I want to get right to the heart of the matter. I've had a lot of feedback on this panel, and I've had several people reach out and say, I, I want to make sure we don't focus too much on challenges. We want to focus on solutions. I think that's important, and that's where our focus is going to be today. But to begin with, I want to ask Chris, what are what does the landscape look like from a uh, tribal and an economic background, what does that look like for someone coming back to the tribe or someone who's a member of a tribe who's maybe gotten out of first term or is coming back after a, a long career in the military? What does the economic landscape look like for them from a jobs perspective? And more importantly, what resources are there uh, from a tribal perspective for veterans in your experience? Thanks, Matt. Those are really all great questions. Um, I guess to get a really good perspective for everybody else, and I'm not sure everybody else out there is familiar with uh, what it's like to live on a reservation or, you know, out there, you know, in maybe an area that is, is not federally recognized, but above and beyond anything else, um, tribes as a whole are, are really located in remote areas such as they aren't, and they aren't, they, they don't have 
the necessary information or resources available to, available to them as somebody who is in the mainstream. So, you know, from the get go, we're not even at the gates, we're still in the barn and so, so to speak, but things are changing. And I think it has to do with a lot with um, the fact that there is more information that's coming out um, readily available be, either, you know, through the internet or just through word of mouth um, that enables a lot of people to develop a sense of direction on what they wanna do. When it comes to Native Americans, veterans who come back, a lot of them, as if you take, if you compare with the ones who are recently separating from the military versus the ones who have in the past, I think um, there's a little, of a, a little of an advantage uh, from the sense that, you know, they know where to go, but still the resources are, unav are, you know, are limited in, in respects to, you know, um, what they need to do to get from point A to point B. Um, so a lot of that has been a historical, uh, historical perspective in, sense, in the sense that, you know, there aren't very many jobs out here and most of the jobs are either affiliated with the BIA, IHS or tribal um, administration and the service industry. And with regards to um, those particular areas, a lot of it is, is, is really dedicated toward the service industry. Some tribes, um, there is a, a general overall consensus or maybe people, a stereotype maybe is a little strong word to use, but people tend to think that most tribes are gaming tribes. And as such, you know, well, they, the, the idea is, well, they don't need money because they have a casino. Well, the reality is, is there are very, there's the numbers of, of, of tribes who are gaming. Of those tribes, um, not mo most of them are fairly, barely making it. So in the sense that, you know, somebody says that, you know, we have money rolling in, you know, that's a, that's a misnomer. So with that, you know, we, we tend to congregate around the fact that a gaming, a gaming entity is going to give us, you know, it's going to be the all, the all, the all be to everything that we need to solve all our problems, which in fact it isn't. Um, it creates more in, um, interesting situations that tribal governments and tribal communities have to deal with everything from the onset of, of addiction to, you know, all the other behavioral aspects that we're looking at. But more importantly, you know, things are changing. They're not changing as quickly. Um, one of the things that I think that's happening and needs to happen is I'm helping tribes develop their natural resources, their economic development efforts, um, you know, developing more cooperation with other outside sources, whether it be banking institutions, um, corporate entities, an influx of, 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 of players who want to work with tribes. Um, the difference being is that the people from the outside don't know necessarily how to access the protocols, you know, that are, that are the, the ways to enter into engagement with tribal governments. But with that being said, you know, Tribes are also understanding their potential in technology. Um, you know, uh, green energy is a big thing, solar, wind, um, you know, hydro. And the other thing too, is that we have other entities um, like the Sandia National Laboratory, who's willing to work and provide technical expertise, just like JPL bringing them out here and helping them, you know, develop a, an educational piece whereby, you know, they, they work with the communities and they have, um, the resources, in-kind resources that, that can provide the tribal communities, which will enhance them to develop more of an opportunity when it comes to, you know, creating jobs and, you know, either through technology or private industry. I myself am in a situation where I launched two months ago a business and uh, non-emergency medical transportation company um, based upon the need and also the fact that the, the existing company that was coming in from the outside didn't have the cultural or was lacking in cultural sensitivity and the traditional aspects of, of working with our elderly. So those are pieces that are all a part of a puzzle, but by no means are they actual attributes toward not having a rosy outlook, so to speak. It's working toward developing a solution. And one of the solutions that we look to, and I think it's under and we're undermining ourselves as communities is not fostering and mentoring and putting in place the veteran community, which in, in, in a sense, they are our next generation of leadership because they have the work ethic, the, you know, the structure, you know, they have that base. Um, and 
So what we need to do, what I feel we need to do is we need to complement what they have and, and bring them in the fold and have them provide us some sort of sense of recommendation and suggestions on what they might be able to provide. And Hesperus, I think, will enable them or enable us and then them to empower themselves to do something like that. So I appreciate the segue and the layup. Um, I because I, I, I I'm going to talk. We're going to talk next with Teresa, who has actually transitioned recently, and talk about her experience at the micro level and the individual level about what that looked like for her, right? And I and I want to make an important uh, distinction here, and and maybe later in discussion we can talk about that. We have a lot of folks that are a lot of tribal communities that are within metro areas, right? Um, here in San Diego. Uh, in the Phoenix area, there's Gila River, there's a lot of other ones around the country. But we also have a lot of folks that are in rural areas. And um, I think that the challenges are there in both communities. But I think uh, that it's important to spell out the differences for folks that are going back to more urbanized or suburban area versus a, a rural area. Anyway, Tris, I'd love it if you could talk to me about your transition story and what that looked like for you. Awesome. Thank you, Matt. Um, yes. So I moved to LA in 2017 and um, the market is just a lot more saturated, uh, a lot more competition. And I really needed to look for some resources to help me stand out. Um, so I started working with Goodwill Veteran Employment Services and they informed me about uh, the hackathon that I met Matt at with the City of Hope. Um, so I was grateful to be a part of that as that allowed me to have more confidence in my endeavors. But a lot of it was self-seeking and just looking for resources. And um, luckily I'm in a city that provides that um, in, in, in LA, but I was also considering moving back home to New Mexico. And it was a scary thought because uh, I have peers back home that have a hard time with finding employment. Um, there aren't very many options out there. And, um, and I work in finance or I work in admin. So I feel they're just, I'd be in the same situation, um, dealing with competition or other individuals that had had more tenure. So um, with that being said, I did see uh, more opportunities in the tech space, as we can see, it, it is, they're striving in our economy um, today. And um, while being around different functions that uh, cater to veterans in the Los Angeles area, like uh, the Microsoft program MSSA or um, VetForce, for example, with Salesforce, um, I was getting ideas as to what type of job training is available for veterans. And when I last spoke with Matt um, at a USC game, he mentioned his ideas about catering to the, well, actually to, to, to give more, he noticed a need in the Native American veteran tribal communities. And um, that's nothing, that's something I never really thought about, but that, that was me as well, that applied to me. Um, because I, I am an individual. I, I wasn't sure what type of resources I had. And that's why I tend, me or other veterans tend to stay within borderline uh, uh, cities or to metro areas to gain that experience, to, um, to, to maintain our modern contemporary lifestyle and to be able to go home and um, visit our families and help those that are having a hard time finding employment. I mean, to be honest, I think that's a lot, a lot of what uh, Native Americans do because going home is, is going to rural areas is like a luxury because it's hard to afford. There is no really no um, stable source of income. So when Matt had mentioned providing tech opportunities and training opportunities to Native American uh, areas and, and uh, focusing on veterans, I thought that was a brilliant idea because veterans are, you know, they are flexible and they, they're, they're ready to, to learn, they're ready to lead and they have great work ethics and um, they're go-getters. So I, I figured that's a great way to start. And from there, you know, we can just help others in, in the surrounding areas. 
So um, my journey, it, it's been self-seeking. I, I do feel um, honored to have more uh, resources available to me. And I believe it's just because I'm in the LA area. But I also, I think about my fellow veterans that are in rural areas and I've had conversations with them. And they've either had to be work at home mothers or they just had to um, network through friends but there weren't very many resources that served them or helped them to transition or build themselves to be where they could be. So thank you. No, and I'll tell you uh, two things. One is uh, I have three teenagers in my house and no one uses the word brilliant when they're referring to me. So I appreciate that. I really do. Uh, I don't think that's ever gonna happen. So this is my high watermark right now in this webinar. Um, hey, so, uh, and I appreciate your individual experience because I think it's important to realize that in this country, we tend to characterize vets as, as a monolith, right? And they tend to be white, they tend to be male, and they tend to be in certain areas of the economy. And that's what's mainly projected through our media, right? But really the veteran experience is the United States experience. It's people from all walks of life. It's people from all backgrounds and people always go home, right? And we need to think about what that looks like. So I, I, one reason that Kim and I have been such good partners in this, and, and, and really we've talked about this for a long time, is because we recognize that the veteran experience is a very diverse experience. And I'm going to refer to her resume here. She used to work for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and she traveled this country looking at that experience from all walks of life, from all aspects, and was helping communities kind of do the work that was required to make sure this transition was as easy as possible. Kim, I'd like for you to talk a little bit about that, what you saw both in metro and urban areas, but also in rural areas. And what are some things that we need to think about when we discuss transition and supporting veteran populations? Uh, thanks, Matt. Yeah, as, as uh, Matt has said, you know, I have traveled quite a bit, in fact, about uh, 650 communities uh, over the past decade. Uh, and that includes, you know, the very uh, uh, rural areas uh, to very urban areas, right? In the in the city, in in Manhattan, and Los Angeles, and and Miami, and things like that. But, you know, when we look at the veterans, right? We look at, you know, and and I think uh, between Matt and Charissa and, and Chris, we've we've already kind of mentioned that the veteran community is a wide breadth of folks that serve. It's it's there's. Native Americans, there's Asians, there's Hispanic, there's Caucasians, there's African American. I, you know, every sector of society is represented in our military. And so after we serve, you know, when we serve, and I was, I was thinking about this the other day, you know, when we serve, we are part of some of the most highly trained, highly capable teams out there, right? We, uh, we have you know, whether you're on a ship or whether you're in the army or in the Marine Corps or the Air Force, you know, the, 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 the capabilities that we have and the team that we're a part of is unlike any other. It's when we make that transition out, when we, when we and our families, because I always include in our discussion the families as well, when we transition out back into civil society, if you go back to a very urban area, you've got a lot of resources there. There's, there maybe there's probably a VA hospital there, or there's probably, you know, there's resources there if you happen to be a homeless veteran, or there's, you know, employment services right there. All these things that can be there, uh, which they do have their, their challenges as well. Don't get me wrong, you know, that just because you live in an urban area doesn't mean that everything's all sunshine and rainbows because that's clearly not the case. Um, that, but, when you go to the very uh, rural areas, those services don't exist as readily available, right? I mean, I, I heard stories in northern was in, in northern Minnesota where you know if you if you, veterans up there in Duluth had to drive you know three and a half hours just to get to Minneapolis, well, if they're driving three and a half hours to go to the VA, and then maybe you have a three hour appointment and you have to drive three and a half hours back home. You're now gone nine, nine hours. And what if you have children? You got to be able to have daycare for them, right? A lot of these challenges for folks that are in the rural tribal areas. Also, you know, access to education is very difficult 
when you're in rural areas because a lot of our folks when I was traveling around the country back in you know, you know between 2000 and 2005 there's a there we still were running into homes that didn't have internet they would have to go to maybe a local library or they would have to go to a, a community center that had internet. People didn't have these Wi-Fi hotspots with like, you know, uh, like Beat Navy or something as a, as a Wi-Fi hotspot name or something like that. But, you know, it's, it's um, one of those things where it, <laughs> that the access to resources is what we need to be to to work on, and I think that every community has the capability of being able to figure out what resources they are. We just have to encourage folks to be more inclusive, vice assuming that somebody else is going to take care of the problem. And we need to be more proactive, uh, vice reactive to to some of the challenges. Yeah, absolutely. So, so you know, let's kind of get into. What does it look like from a problem solving standpoint? Um, what role, and I, I would ask first, are there, and I know there are, but then what role do tribal veteran organizations play when folks return back home, right? So uh, Chris has mentioned, uh, and I know that he's had experience with his tribal veteran organization with his father. Um, you know, Teresa, you mentioned it as well. So what tribal resources are there uh, and does it vary tribe by tribe? Is there a national advocacy organization for veterans who uh, are Native American? Or is it more, hey, it depends on your community and the resources that your individual community has? And I'm opening that up to the, to the group. I'll take a stab at it. Okay. Um, well, basically the answer is everything's localized from a, from, from a tribal community perspective. Um, you know, we're based on, our budget is based primarily on government funding, resources that come available, and therefore um, associations, veterans associations are equated to, you know, whatever trickle down they get from the federal, from the tribal budgets. Um, so the reality is that it's limited, and, and when everything is limited, everything is in kind. Sometimes, uh, you know, they have to pick up the pieces in order to get from point A to point B. Um, and there's more that can be done. It's just a matter uh, you know, of, of finding alternative or options that can meet the shortfall. Right, and the way I see it is, um, if you don't mind me stepping in, um, that a lot of what is available now is not necessarily working. Um, a lot of my peers, or um, other veterans I, 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 I talked with, they mentioned that they had to fend for themselves, that just like everybody else, they were looking for employment and just had to acclimate where they could see fit just to have income, to put food on the table, to take care of their families. Um, so it, it, it just doesn't seem to be working at the moment. And that's why I feel other organizations that know how to implement processes or ideas would definitely benefit rural areas. We could use the help. And especially now during the COVID crisis, um, I don't see any veteran officials coming out to really implement any programs. And especially in the Navajo Nation, um, everything has to be distanced. I, I believe right now it's on lockdown. Um, so nobody's going anywhere. And if they don't even have internet access, and I have a very good article I, I could put in the chat box. It's good. It, it's very, it has a lot of good stats um, that stresses the um, scarcity of internet access. Yeah, please do that. And there are two things I want to highlight. I'm not going to get into it because, again, we only have an hour and it's late for some of you. I'll probably put you to sleep. But the important thing is to understand two things. One is the digital divide on uh, in rural communities, especially tribal communities. In other words, broadband access and the access to technology. The second piece is the impact of COVID in these communities too. We hear about that a lot in the abstract. For those of you that live in these areas, um, you know what I'm talking about firsthand. And that has a direct impact on all sorts of aspects of life, but especially on transition, finding jobs and employment specifically. This is a big deal. It's, it's, it's impacting us as a nation, but in tribal communities and in rural communities without these resources, um, it, it's a major 
issue that will have ramifications and consequences long after we have a vaccine for COVID. Um, I wanted to ask another question uh, before I talk a little bit about Hesperus uh, and what we're doing in this space before we open it up to Q&A, right? Like I'm eager, to, I see a lot of questions coming up and I'm excited uh, to talk about some of your, your questions. But for Kim, I wanted to ask you, you know, these aren't just veterans and they're not, they're also non-traditional students in the academic sense, but they're adult learners. The reason I partnered with Nash University is a very simple one. Can you talk about this particular type of student and why there needs to be a special sensitivity around them? Oh, absolutely. So uh, a little bit about National University. We actually were founded by a retired Navy captain who saw the need to figure out a way to provide educational uh, curriculum to adult learners, uh, to folks that are already working, that already had a job, that non-traditional student, um, and uh, in a 30-day format where uh, you start a class on the first and you've taken the, the final by the 30th, uh, and, and only focusing on one subject per month. Uh, and so, it, to this day, National University, our, our students are primarily the non-traditional students, uh, the adult learners, folks that are already married, already have careers, uh, children, a family. And so most of our, you know, you know when COVID hit and, and, you know, everyone had to go online, National University, we were primarily already online. We only had to move roughly 20% of our courses uh, uh, to online. The majority were already online. Most of our courses courses are offered in an asynchronous fashion, meaning that, you know, when, when you go home after working all day and, you know, preparing meals and helping children do homework or do whatever it is that adult learners do, and then maybe you can log on at two o'clock in the morning after everything's done to do your coursework, that's okay, because that's the way the courses are structured. And so, National University recognizes that. They also recognize the fact that these adult learners also come with very unique um, challenges, but also very unique strengths to be able to do this. And so with the tailorization of the curriculum, with looking at how we're, going, we're setting up this program with Hesperus, um, to create a, you know, digital skills type programs for our, our Native American veterans. It's, it's key to, I think, to the, not only getting that, that education that's needed, but then the, the meaningful employment. And that's, I think, something that National University is very good at as far as the, the B2B working relationships and finding the employment opportunities uh, for our students. Matt? Yeah, go ahead. I'd like to make, uh, a Two points here, um, given kind of the direction we're going in. And I, I want to really emphasize the fact that in no way do I believe or want to perceive that Native American communities throughout the country are, are in a situation whereby, you know, they're, they, they can't get out of the hole by themselves. Um, what, what I am suggesting, and you and I have talked about this long before, you know, that the structure of it has to be, there has to be parity. And there, up until this point, there's lack of parity. And it's not like we want to come in and promise everything. What we need to do is we need to identify um, processes, programs, projects that are already existing within the corporate community, so to speak, like, like I do when I talk about economic development and education. We'll use like um, Intel, for example. Intel has a great, great, great um, education program that they, that they, they utilize and they implement within mainstream. What we need to do is we need to focus on taking that and implementing it into a Native American community, but as such, realizing that there are some cultural sensitivity and traditional aspects that need to be tweaked. So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to identify and the rationale is, is we don't want to recreate the wheel. We don't want to restructure anything that hasn't been already structured, but all we want to do is we want to bring it in. You and I both talked before when we, we identified that, you know, on the majority of Native American in, within the Native American communities, you don't have DevOps, you don't have levers, and it's 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 a function that you know that we need to identify and how we can better you know ut um, utilize those two avenues, but also incorporate the traditional and the cultural sensitivity aspect. Because I'll use this, uh, I'll give you an example. When I was at NASA, 
they had a they had a university initiative office. They had Hispanic, African American, and Native American program. The Native American program office was failing just miserably. And um, I had a, a director, Dr. Yvonne Freeman, and she came in and she said, "You know, you're going to take it." I'm like, "Why am I going to take it?" Because they're taking a program that was designed for a specific group, and they're trying to essentially put a square peg in a round hole. When in fact, you got to understand what you're doing in order to get it to make something successful. You can't just arbitrarily throw something out there. So what you and I talk about is is finding these resources and these um, opportunities and bringing them and making them available here within the Native American communities, empowering our people to structure and focus on what they wanna do, inclusive of the, of some of the tribes have um, tribal colleges and universities. How can we best utilize that to focus and expand on that resource of these individuals? You know, we also have, you know, the, the application of broadband, but there's a misconception with broadband. We have, the St. Cross Apache tribe, along with not, uh, eight other tribes, have uh, a telecommunications company. And sometimes the idea that since a tribe owns a telecommunications company, broadband is free. It's not free. Therefore, a lot of people have, you know, it's a disparity because you can't access the broadband even though your tribe owns a telecommunications company. And to Carissa's point, you know, I grew up on the Navajo Reservation. My first nine years of my life was spent in LA. My father didn't want to come back because he understood the value of jobs and what a job can do. And he understood that there was little or next to nothing, but he found something working at the mines. But where I'm going with this is that as a kid, you go down to the 7-Eleven, get whatever you want. You watch TV and all of a sudden you're uprooted. And I'm out in the reservation in a little town called Kianta where radio access was only at night. We got our mail, you know, every other day because the post office was 20 miles down the road. The nearest town was about, on average, about an hour and a half. And things still haven't cha hasn't changed. But what we need to change is our idea and our philosophy about how we can bring those resources readily back to the tribe. So I've been to Kayenta and I've been there to look for fry bread and the place was closed by the time I got there. So I, I don't have the fondest memories of Kayenta, but it's a, I, I've been out there a couple of years ago. I think what's important is to talk about opportunities. And that's the whole reason that uh, a group of us got together and, and came up with the idea of Hesperus. And I want to talk about that for a few minutes, and then we're going to open it up to Q&A. I want to acknowledge, though, I really appreciate the comments in the chat and the crosstalk that's going on. Um, you know, people are sharing contacts, people are sharing programs, and that I think that this is very important when we talk about limited resources and rural opportunities, uh, tribal communities, that we share what we know. And I appreciate that happening. And I want to continue to do that. We will also send out uh, a newsletter, everyone here. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll send you a, a note after the chat. We'll talk more about that. But um, we're going to be sharing a lot of these resources, right? Uh, my good friend, Lori Adams, has worked with me with uh, DOL to uh, support this community and bring more visibility to it. And uh, I know Juanita Mullen, uh, I know Stephanie Birdwell over DA. There are a lot of folks that are doing good work in this area, and we want to make sure we're all talking. So what is Hesperus, right? Why did I call this together? I, I think it's one thing to, to sit around in our celebration months and talk about problems, but it's much more important to talk about solutions. And Hesperus is a nonprofit dedicated to serving Native American communities through education, employment, and technology. We've talked about all those themes today. We've talked about their importance, not just in tribal communities, but everywhere for veterans. And so I decided that who better to lead an initiative to support Native American communities than a veteran and someone that had that experience trying to place people into jobs after training them in the IT sector and using technology to bridge some of those gaps and bring people to parity, as Chris mentioned. Hesperus is a, focused on those communities with a special emphasis on Native American veterans and their families. We will launch our first cohort next summer. But what I want to talk about is everyone, you're familiar with the term skill bridge or career skills programs. But what I see is a lack of emphasis on veterans in those programs, which I understand. But what happens when someone leaves the protective cocoon of the military base where they're separating from and they've got to go back home? What happens to all those programs? Hesper's designed to address that need in tribal communities. 
So the summit program is the very first program Hesperus will offer. The summit program is an IT training program, roughly five to six months in length, which will offer a three-legged stool to support education, employment, and technology proficiency for Native American veterans and their families. So if we talk about three-legged stool, what are they? We're gonna have an academic curriculum. Hesperus will provide an academic curriculum through National University with live virtual instruction supported by IT labs and technical support for the entire duration of the cohort. These veterans are gonna be taught by professionals who live and breathe the IT industry. We're also gonna focus on mentorship so that these folks go through the program, not only are they being taught by instructors, but they also have mentors that are from the IT industry that are supporting them as they make this transition. The most important aspect I wanna highlight here over 50% of our, my mentors will be Native American. I want our students to see success in the industry that they're trying to get into and a focus on cultural sensitivity in the program. And that starts with the folks that are helping teach them and helping shepherd them through this course. Um, I've, I'm already talking to several large tech companies, Microsoft and Amazon uh, in specifically about having them support through their indigenous peoples groups, the mentorship program with this cohort. Lastly, we're gonna attract uh, we're going to have two partners and probably more pro uh, professional development partners to support our efforts to find these folks jobs, prepare them for the market, teach them how to interview, and focus on creating solid resumes and LinkedIn profiles. Why is that important? It's important because we can't neglect the transition while we're also doing the educational instruction. And this will be a high pressure situation. It's gonna be like drinking from a fire hose. I can tell you because I have six years experience working in this area in tech, but this is what's gonna be successful for anyone that wants to get into the IT industry. I think it's important to recognize that from a professional development standpoint, the report card for Hesperus, it's not certifications. It's not how many folks are in the class and it's not graduation. The success marker, the metric I care most about is employment. And all of us at Hesperus will be very focused on jobs or opportunities that lead to jobs through technical training out of our program. So uh, having done this for a while, you know, Charissa mentioned it, Chris mentioned it, jobs are the stability factor for the individual, for the family, and for the community. Solid employment means stability for everyone. And that's going to be the marker for success for our program. I mentioned that we'll start next summer. Uh, COVID may have something to do with that, but we're striving to develop to deliver a virtual program uh, by next summer. And we want to ensure that uh, folks on this call and as we get this program up and running are aware that this will be culturally sensitive, as I mentioned before, for Native American students. Um, you know, one thing we didn't talk about is why is it important to have a culturally sensitive, culturally sensitive program? And why is it important to create opportunities, job opportunities that are either on reservations or close to home? Because this population, these folks want to get back home. They need to be home close to their families. They have to take care of their loved ones. But more importantly, they have to be home for ceremonies, powwows, dances, and a number of other cultural uh, activities that are extremely important. We want to reinforce that at Hesperus. I want to support that there. And so do all of us on this call. So we wanted to create a program that was sensitive to those folks, but also more importantly, that supported a job that was remote, a job that was hybrid or a job that could be done. And then folks could get back home to their communities. Who do we partner with? We're going to partner with Native American advocacy organizations. Chris has mentioned uh, ACES. I have an active partnership with the American Indian College Fund and a the uh, Intertribal Council of Arizona. We'll, we have a number of other folks that we'll be talking to and strengthen our relationships with so that they understand we're here for them and we're here for the community. We'll also partner with a lot of veteran service organizations. And I don't mean folks that are uh, in small communities around the country. I'm talking about large national organizations to bring visibility, awareness, and resources to this community. That's been a big chart, uh, a, a charter issue for Kim and I is to go out into the community, talk to folks who support the veteran community as a whole and ask for those resources to be brought back to these communities to support these folks. Lastly, I'm doing a lot of outreach to corporations and I would like them from a uh, diversity inclusion, a social justice, talent acquisition or a philanthropic motivation or all four is fine with me to support our work 
because ultimately they can hire these folks and bring them into their company. They can really focus on making sure that these people have a home in corporate America. Uh, joining us tonight is Danielle Applegate from Cerner Corporation. Cerner has been my very first corporate sponsor. I just wanted to thank her publicly. She's been awesome, but Cerner is dedicated to investing in this community. And there are other companies that we'll be talking to and working with, they're gonna do that. So there are people listening outside of the community that understand the importance and I'm bringing them to the table and I want them to support the work we're gonna do. We're gonna be in a cohort model. And I think the most important thing to understand is that this program ultimately will be free for participants in the Native American community, especially vets. We're building toward that. Right now, we're going to have to use some government uh, benefits like the GI Bill as we get it off the ground. But my goal from a fundraising standpoint, and I know that Kim and I have discussed this at length, is to ultimately make this free for folks as they come into the program. And so that it serves as a, a point of transition, a new beginning rather than a point of stress and a financial burden as they transition out of the service and move into their new job in corporate America. So. That being said, I see that folks can go three different ways. One is into uh, an entry-level job in the IT industry from this program. Second, they can go into deeper technical training, such as with a, uh, I would use uh, Microsoft data centers or a similar program as a possibility for that jumping off point. Intel has a native veteran scholars program, as well as a veteran scholars program. And then lastly, uh, I would say that this is also a stepping stone to higher education, whether it's through tribal colleges or through community colleges and institutions, uh, you know, four-year college, including National University, so folks can continue and get their degree that way. This is a jumping off point, and I want to take a, a, a moment to recognize that, uh, you know, I regret that there's not something out there, and I saw the opportunity last year. I talked with a lot of smart people that are in this space, and we decided it was time to do something, and so this Hesperus is something I think we can all be proud of, but more importantly, I'll need your support and I'll really need your input. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm glad to see the chat lines opening up. I sound like I'm doing some sort of Memorial Day or, or Labor Day, uh, you know, telethon or something, but it's great to see all the crosstalk and discussion around this. I gave you a very quick overview of Hesperus, what we're doing, and more importantly, our launch. I will be putting out a lot of information and email as well as a website here shortly in the next couple of weeks. But I wanted to invite all of you to be the first people to hear about what we're doing and that really the, the challenges we're trying to solve for in this community. With that, uh, Mike, I'm gonna open it up to questions. And um, you know, I wanna be able to, in about 10 minutes, answer some questions if I can. And then of course, I'd invite everybody to connect with me afterwards. You have my email because some of you have reached me to follow with me individually if you need to. Any sure. questions? I'm going to, I'm going to drop the uh, questions into the chat, but I'll also mention them out loud. So Joe asked, does Veterans Affairs offer assistance or have Native American veterans programs? They do. Uh, the VA has special programs involve everything from home ownership to uh, a special tribal liaison. All uh, chairmen and leaders of Native American tribes have direct access to the upper echelons of leadership at the VA. And there are also several partnership programs that they have. One of my goals is on our next talk in a couple of months is to bring in one of those liaisons that we have that manages the American Southwest and that I've spoken with before. So they do have programs in terms of uh, housing and some uh, connection and communication programs. But where the VA needs, I, I think, some work or where I would suggest some work, and we've talked about this as in telehealth programs for rural and tribal communities, I think that's very important, as well as some work Chris and I have done trying to connect healthcare providers on the reservations with uh, VA referrals that are an hour or two away to make sure that that is a seamless transition, right? I think there's a lot more work we can do there. Um, and then there's also some work that VA has done yeah, specifically around tribal communities and colleges. Uh, I just posted something on LinkedIn not too long ago about a bill that's in Congress that was introduced by Deb Holland and some others about supporting Native American veterans on tribal uh, college campuses. So there are some, some pieces here and there. 
I know some of you have better experience than I do with some of those programs. They are there. I would say the VA has a way to go, but at the same time, I don't view the responsibility as totally theirs. All right, so uh, the next question is, um, Ku Ule, um, from Ku Ule. I hope I didn't butcher that. Um, what is the best way for organizations to find tribal veteran organizations by state so we can reach out to partner? That's a great question. I think there are two routes. One is through your um, department. If you have a department, and I know New Mexico and New Arizona, Washington, the state of Washington have departments in their federal, in their state government apparatus that deal specifically with tribes. And I'd say you work through them, but also you can work through your veterans organizations that are in your state. I did see a couple of questions around, hey, who can I contact in the New York City metro area? Um, Chris is a great resource. I'm putting him on the spot here. Chris is a great resource. And Chris, I would love to know if someone were trying to reach a certain tribe or they're trying to reach a resource group, a national advocacy group or resource group, what's the best way to do that? What's the best way to search for those? Well, there are a couple of ways. There's one where you, each region has their own organization, for instance, uh, Northwest Affiliated Tribes, it's, uh, Southern California Tribal Chairman's Association. Here in Arizona, you know, you have the ITCA up in the Northwest. Um, as the Confederate tribes, um, or what you need, what you could do is you could, um, what I always generally do is just do some walking via telephone calls or internet connections and, and just kind of networking our way. What's really, it, to, to speak to the advantage of being in, uh, being native <laughs> is the understanding that nothing is six degrees, six degrees of separation, there's always two degrees. And so my point being is, if you hear the water drop in Washington, you'll know in Arizona. And then if you, if you hear something, the drum beat in, in, in the Northeast, you're gonna hear it wherever. We're a small, the, we're as, as tribal communities go, we're vast, but the number of us know one another intimately. So, you know, it, it just takes a little bit of effort. And most certainly um, I am open to helping and assisting and facilitating that process. Um, you know, just through the various contexts that I have. Sorry, I was on mute. I'll direct any question I get to the appropriate folks on the panel uh, to give you the best information. Um, I think that would be important. I also saw a question in the chat, Mike, I'm going to jump over you real quick about small business uh, administration and entrepreneurship. Uh, that's a timely question. I'm actually working on a couple of initiatives around entrepreneurship aligning some outside corporations who are very interested in supporting that with a couple of veteran serving organizations that want to focus on Native American entrepreneurs. Um, I'd love to connect with you, Ray, but also I'd like to let everyone know that Hesperus will be focused on our own programs, but will be a connector for uh, areas involving education, employment, entrepreneurship, and technology moving forward in the future. Uh, can I jump in there real quick? Sure. Um, yeah, uh, to add on to what you just said, another resource that the individual, individual might want to contact is Chris James or Chad Marsden at the National Center for American Indian um, Enterprise Development. Um, they certainly have the fortitude of finding or providing um, the individual with either information about SBA loans or AA certifications, um, any which way might think of. So um, I highly recommend reaching out to them. They're the also they're also the organization who sponsors RES um, each year. And unfortunately, because of COVID, I think that's probably going to be um, um, held back for a little bit. And RES is the, um, um, it's just a, um, I got me on the spot here, is um, the Reservation Economic Summit. I'm glad you answered that because I couldn't have told you. All right, another question. Oh, it looks like Teresa posted that article. I would direct everybody to that article on connectivity and the digital divide in tribal communities. Uh, I encourage all of you to follow the four of us on LinkedIn uh, to various degrees. We all talk about this. Um, the digital divide is probably half of the issue that I see that I can affect. The other half is training, obviously. Um, you'll see a lot from me on that. You'll be sick of it. In fact, you'll probably unfollow me, but I'll be honest, it's one of the greatest challenges that are facing rural communities, but specifically tribal communities. And, and we've alluded to some of the FCC 
um, discussions and controversy that's happened in the past around this. This is a huge area uh, for what I would term improvement to be uh, exact. We can do a lot better in this area. <clears throat> Anything else, Mike? Have, we, have I missed anybody? I saw some questions, I saw some other people jumping in. Um, there was just a little bit more to the uh, question for about New York resources. Uh, they were looking for um, additional reemployment or tech skill trainings, basic computer skills, MS Word, Excel, uh, that are geared toward Native American veterans. So resources or uh, places that they can go to to um, find these kind of uh, uh, trainings. Okay, yeah, and I would ask you to reach out. I know of a lot of trainings that are possible through the tech industry that aren't necessarily mainstreamed. In other words, they reside on these philanthropic websites and then nobody knows about them. Um, I'm connected to several organizations that support like Microsoft, uh, Salesforce, through their VetForce program, as well as some others. Um, and, and I think in closing with what I wanna talk about and you know, to kind of sum this up, is that ultimately we're gonna work with veterans and start with vets and their families. But as Chris mentioned, we view the next generation of leadership in these tribal communities starting with vets. And if you look at the landscape for tribal chairmen, council members, business leaders, and other folks in the community, a vast disproportionate number are vets and they lead the way. And we feel that this is a great area to concentrate our efforts initially, but we serve the whole community. Hesperus will serve the entire Native, Native American community and we'll create a lot of opportunity, whether it's through education, employment, or just broadband access, Wi-Fi access, that's our mandate and that's our goal. So um, I, uh, I wanna close by saying, number one, I appreciate everybody being here. If you're on the East Coast, you probably notice the light in everybody's rooms. We've all gotten darker and more stark. I don't know if shadow is good for us or bad, probably good for me, you guys are, there are less of me to see. But the important thing is that I appreciate you taking the time to learn more and to listen more. We're gonna be doing a lot of outreach. Uh, please follow us, Hesperus on LinkedIn. Um, we'll put out all of our social media contacts through a follow-up email. But also uh, I will uh, send you a newsletter for your participation today and we'll continue to follow up with you about what we're doing and the progress we're making. We're excited about some of our sponsors. We're very excited about some of our partners. And as those become official, we're gonna let everyone know about the good work we're doing in this area. Lastly, what can you do? What role can you play? Number one, I like to highlight those programs that are successful, that people are aware of, that other folks need to know about. Number two, what's the need out there? And where do you see opportunities? And I'm talking about around specific initiatives and with tribes and communities that are moving forward. You know, we're always looking for people to partner with and we can deliver a lot more sometimes than we even know ourselves. So I'm always looking for opportunities. Lastly, after this call, you'll get a, an email, a follow-up email. Um, we will have this call recorded and there'll be an opportunity for you to support Hesperus directly. Um, you know, we're in the awareness phase. We're also in the fundraising phase. And I appreciate anybody that is interested in supporting us, uh, whether it's from a, a mentorship uh, level, hiring our graduates next year, or that wanna support us uh, directly through financial or other means. We're gonna do a lot together. And I appreciate all of you being here at the start of the journey. I really wanna say thank you to my panel, Chris, Charissa and Kim about taking time out to talk about this issue. But most importantly, you all either learning more or, and I know a lot of you, you're gonna take the opportunity to help me learn more, which is what I want. And I will include you on the journey as we get Hesperus underway and we begin our work in this community. So again, thank you. I hope everyone has a great night and I hope you enjoy your holidays that are coming up, right? I don't know with COVID how the holidays are gonna feel, if it's gonna be a break for us or if it's gonna be another day in the house, but uh, I hope everybody has some good plans and they celebrate safely. Thank you very much. <laughs>